So we will be, after we go through the presentation, um, there'll be an opportunity to pass around the mic for any questions, as well as if folks want to leave any notes from the white, um, the white sheet here in the back out against the wall, if you would like to leave any questions that you'd, um, as another form, and then we will be also capturing any questions and um, as well um, here, um, so we can then internally be able to let the board know what the feedback was from the community. So we will get started. And so We'll get started here with our Measure G slide. And so on page five, Sid? So on page five here, we have our timeline to date. And so what this timeline reflects here is since we passed Measure G, the work that's been started to be able to build our team, bring on our team of experts here, and starting with a com who we brought in for program as well as construction management for Measure G. And so they're really helping us steer the ship for Measure G. Um, for the middle school side, we have brought on Leonakis. Um, they are helping us with all full architectural and engineering services for the middle school site. And so far, um, we have brought on for two of our school sites, Strawberry Point, as well as Tam Valley, JK um, Architect and Engineering, they are handling full architecture and engineering sites um, for Tam Valley and Strawberry. All of these were procured through a request for proposal and qualifications. And so this is just another update of additional consultants who we either have selected, but have yet to bring on board. Um, we have here um, our architect and engineering team, which I discussed for the middle school and elementary school so far. Um, we have our topo and utility surveys that we're going to be working with Moran Engineering. Um, they've been, we're doing work on going at Tam Valley, Strawberry, and the middle school. And for our California Quality Act CEQA consultant, is, um, we have our, um, I'm sorry, we have the firm's SCA Environmental for Hazmat, as well as Grisati Environmental for CEQA. And so they will be the firms that we'll be bringing on to help us advise us and to do the work around those scopes of work. And for geotechnical services, once we have, um, we have a site validation that we're gonna be bringing to the board in October, that's the next board meeting, as well in February, we'll have bringing to the board in the first quarter is um, the conceptual design of the middle school for approval. That's when we will then bring on our geotechnical services post, post that decision. And currently we've been in our lease lease back request for proposals and qualifications. That's for our modernization projects, as well as for our middle school site. And so bringing in a general contractor, we have interviews tomorrow from that we receive proposals from, from our request for proposals and qualifications. And then we would be bringing those firms to the board in October for a request for approval. And then we would bring back negotiated contracts in the November board meeting. And as well as we, we who we've already introduced tonight is into action. They're helping us with our community outreach and planning. Next slide, slip, please. So we have, this is our Measure G master schedule. And so this Measure G master schedule is, scared at every, uh, is shared at every school board meeting. Um, this is the high level look at what we're looking for for the middle school construction, as well as the temporary housing. And then as our elementary sites with the middle school being the main focus to start out at, which is the encompasses the most Measure G funds. And so currently the red line reflects where we're at currently. Um, like I was saying before, the next decision point we have that we're going to be bringing forward to the board is where we're going to, which site we're going to build the middle school out of. That's going to be coming back in October. We did share um, that presentation that's going to be shared tonight in September. And then in the first quarter is our goal is to bring them to the board, um, a conceptual design for the middle school request for approval in the quarter, first quarter of 2024. And so this is will be continually in our Measure G update and to reflect any changes that happen to the schedule, as well as just a, a reminder to make sure everybody's aware of all our milestones and dates. And I will pass this to Brett um, from AECOM to go over our timeline for the middle school. And, uh, you know, if I could replace the word timeline a little bit with process, uh, if, if process driven approaches makes more sense to you than than timestamps. Uh, this is this is intended to give you sort of a process-driven overview of our of our effort. Uh, we have the datum line where we are at today, the activities that, that have been going on up to and including today, 
and obviously, you know, tomorrow we have a big day with interviewing um, our partners for lease lease back. And, you know, we're going to be bringing that to the board for approval uh, of a lease lease back partner at the next board meeting. Hopefully uh, by November will be, that'll give us an opportunity to move into contract negotiations and then November bring back a contract for approval. And then we really get into the nuts and bolts of design, budget development, and and those types of things. Bringing it back, uh, you can see in the bottom there, board approve board approval for the guaranteed maximum price. For those of you that aren't familiar with that acronym, acronym, sorry, GMP, that's the guaranteed maximum price. It'll bring to the district in June, and then we build. So this is more of a process driven look at it. If that helps. So we thought we would uh, dig into a little bit more detail. This is small text, um, the next slide. And that is what our activities are going to be between now and uh, conceptual design uh, with the board in February. Should I hold Sid? Oh, no, that's okay. I didn't know if something was stuck over there. Um, so uh, the, the big takeaway from this is we're at the first column. And the first column is the first meeting of five between now and February for the community. Uh, we will also have staff engagement uh, during that time and uh, site-based committees for the middle school, just to get to the point of uh, looking at a site plan and uh, looking at the program for the middle school. So today we're here to sh tell you what we know to date, um, but also to identify the things that we uh, has still have to dig deeper into some of the engineering studies and other things that will come with um, narrowing down the options. So uh, throughout this process, uh, open and transparent communication about where we are in the process. The next group of slides that we'll share with you were the, is the same uh, slides for those of you who are at the um, September board meeting, uh, where we presented a number of options uh, to uh, the board of trustees uh, to which they had a small straw, straw poll uh, to give us some narrowing of how we might move forward. So when we look at um, the six sites that the district owns, we were asked to take a, a high level look at those sites. These are all relative and to scale and uh, look at site adequacy from a size standpoint. Now we can all identify uh, sites that we know in San Francisco Unified or LA Unified that are building big schools on two or three acres. Uh, but in this community, uh, having uh, meeting the California Department of Education guidelines for um, a middle school site was one of the lenses we used to look through this. What um, the California Department of Education guidelines that are part of Title V of the California Code of Regulations, um, depending on how big we end up with the middle school somewhere maybe between 900 or 800 and 1100 um, would require 14 to 18 acres. Below 75% of that, so 10 to 12 and a half or 13 math in my head there, but um, you, you need to provide to the Department of Education your physical education plan. How are you going to serve the needs of the middle school, uh, both uh, physical education, athletics, and curriculum um, on that lesser acreage? So it normally requires some sort of additional indoor spaces or um, a program that shows scheduling around those spaces. So what we did is we we looked at the two largest sites, Edna McGuire and the current Mill, Mill Valley Middle School site. Uh, Edna's just under that 75% threshold and uh, Mill Valley Middle School is within that 75% threshold. Um, and next please, um, considered than the Edna McGuire site and the Mill Valley uh, School site for what we're calling basically test fits to see uh, just what that might look like if we were to explore um, either of those two locations. The first uh, at Edna McGuire, we looked at, uh, next please, um, what that starts to look like if we were to take the Edna McGuire site for a new middle school. 
The first thing is obviously the Edna McGuire students would need a new home. Um, so the ability to uh, transfer them to existing elementary schools um, and whether many at one and few at another or equally throughout was part of the consideration both in cost and schedule implications uh, for the project, but also quite frankly, the disruption of that established um, elementary school uh, community. The second component of this, and you can see on the right hand slide, we started to identify um, we would use the Edna McGuire facilities, but we would need to expand that to meet uh, middle school curriculum goals, gymnasium, science labs, and more classrooms, because clearly the middle school is larger than the Edna site is today. Um, and that would then displace uh, Tara Marin, as well as some district facilities um, and rental facilities that are in that existing um, aging building there. So uh, first phase would be to uh, build the new component of that and uh, then to renovate the existing elementary school to meet middle school objectives. Uh, the example I like to use is the kindergartens will no longer be needed. Uh, what can we imagine those in in a middle school curriculum? How do we take reclaim that space and what renovation would be required to do that? Next, please. So uh, each of the scenarios have the pros and cons as we know them today. Uh, and that is uh, for this site, the middle school would be relocated away from the sewer uh, treatment facility that uh, we would not, likely not need interim housing because they would be interim housed here until that was ready for them. But we would have to first move students onto each of the elementary schools from Edna McGuire to empty that facility out. There seems to be adequate field size um, for that as well. Um, the cons are that the cost and disruption of uh, relocating Edna McGuire, uh, the community has already funded the Edna McGuire site, so a lot of that cost would be uh, lost with a re-renovation and certainly from an implementation schedule timeline in order to get all the elementaries ready before we start moving any middle schoolers, it appears to have the longest implementation uh, schedule. The second um, option and the remaining three options are all at the middle school site. Uh, the first one uh, that we're calling uh, the West option is basically replacing the campus uh, in its current location, albeit different configurations to meet the current educational uh, goals of the site. So um, this comes with a need then because we'd be, be displacing everyone who's in this school right now with building uh, interim housing for the entire classroom population uh, at the site. And so uh, that is obviously um, a costly and dis disruptive, but it does uh, put uh, the site um, in the existing location uh, closer to the intersection. Next, please. You can see in this, we start to uh, build the interim uh, campus so that we can tear down the existing school, the multi-purpose and food service remains. And uh, then at the completion, we're either, either able to replace or uh, leave the existing multi-purpose in, in uh, its current location. Next, please. Um, and so the pros and cons are the visibility and presence, uh, similar or better than where it is now, uh, the ability to preserve the gym or cafe and the modulars that go with that. Um, that we mentioned costly interim housing, some loss of parking potentially, and then um, we, whether we do or don't replace the um, gym and modular buildings has a lot to do with budget when we get to that phase of the project. Um, the cor corner, uh, the next one is the corner site, and that's uh, 
more or less the same site, but pushes it a little bit more to the corner so that we're able to build uh, the new gym and cafe. Next, please. Um, all as part of that um, first phase without disruption, disrupting the existing. Again, the interim housing is the same. We'll be looking, these are not detailed drawings, they're test fits. So uh, how that plays out is still yet to come, but the idea would be closer to the corner. And with many, yes, please, um, many of the same uh, pros and cons, uh, the visibility, the differing of the gym replacement, but the uh, costly interim housing. And then we did also explore uh, the east side of the property. Um, next, please. Um, and we did that because it did allow this building to remain in place. Next, please. Um, and in that, uh, we were able to build the majority of the new classroom space, I'll call it on the parking lot uh, area east, while this building remained um, open for students and a working school. And that obviously is going to save on interim housing costs. It will require some sort of interim food service solution and potentially outdoor athletics and PE. Uh, but uh, we thought it was worth bringing forward as those are uh, likely more mitigatable uh, than uh, having um, all of the classrooms uh, displaced. Next, please. So the pros and cons, uh, limited uh, interim housing is certainly um, the big one for this site. Uh, next, please. When we look at the other things we have heard uh, loud and clear and considered. Some of these do fit in that category of further detail will remain. Some of the existing um, studies are aging at this point, 2017, 2018, and will be part of our next steps is the engineering studies to support some of these uh, considerations. Certainly uh, one we've heard is sea level rise um, and the highest priority concerns for the Mill Valley site. Again, there are mitigation strategies uh, for that uh, that we've already considered and are looking at, but it will be one that will be studied in more detail. The sewer plant, we've certainly heard a lot about the smells from the sewer plant. The district monitors the, um, the uh, smells along with the sewer uh, plant staff. Um, and you all who live here uh, know what the implications of that are. What we are considering here is a two-story single building uh, solution for the campus that allows most of the circulation to be indoors. So on those high smell days, we can shut down dampers on the mechanical systems like you would in a fire or uh, those things and have students remain indoors. Again, does it fix the smell issue? No, it's a mitigation uh, that we've talked about. Next, please. And then uh, we've heard a lot about soils and the past landfill um, of this uh, potential site. We have dug into when this building was uh, built and much of that debris um, was removed and replaced with suitable soils at that time, but again, our last information is from 2018. We'll be digging into that um, uh, soil investigation further as the sites become narrowed down. Um, so obviously those are mitigatable issues with um, uh, appropriate foundations for the school, uh, the quality of the soil, uh, but some of the other things we've heard is the potential for um, uh, methane and other uh, gases from the landfill. And uh, we have a couple of projects in construction right now that have uh, construction mitigation around um, that potential. So uh, the recommendations that were presented to the board in September was to eliminate the Edna McGuire option uh, for all the reasons you see there, uh, the disruption, 
the costly expansion. Uh, we're pretty confident, uh, given that the original environmental documents for that site were for an elementary of 600, and we'd be looking at a middle school of 900, 1,000 or more, uh, would um, require a full um, environmental review that would probably um, uh, show some significant traffic impacts in that neighborhood. But um, that was one of the considerations here. Uh, the other is that we continue with the conceptual design for the options at the existing middle school in all locations until we take a little bit deeper dive into that engineering data um, so that we can um, come back and have that discussion uh, with the community. So uh, next in the um, straw poll that we saw uh, from the board, um, they concurred with those recommendations and uh, keeping the um, middle school site options two through four uh, in consideration. Um, the next thing we looked at was interim housing. And obviously with that, um, uh, decision by the board, the uh, the issue becomes less about how do we spread students around the elementary schools and a little bit more about the interim housing um, on this campus. It was really important to the board that the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders stayed together in this interim and temporary solution um, so that the program wasn't uh, disrupted. And so um, there's a lot of things with credentialing teachers and all sorts of um, things that come with that kind of change, especially if it's a temporary change that uh, drove uh, part of that discussion. Because we did present the option of moving sixth graders only only to the elementary schools, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders spread out across the elementary schools. And um, through that discussion, they really thought there was, um, it was a better solution for, uh, because of all those educational impacts to have the full middle school stay together at um, one location to be decided. Right now, it looks like the um, existing middle, middle school site. And so again, uh, just looking uh, quickly that the educational program impacts uh, did have a, a large piece of the consideration and the deliberation that the board had in next please, making their recommendation to maintain that six, eight grade level configuration and for the interim housing to remain at Mill Valley. Again, these weren't action items, they were straw poll items, but it did help uh, us to start to narrow the next level of engineering study that we would need. And for the next steps, we have next slide, please. Yes, for the next steps, we have had two community meetings tonight. We started one at four o'clock with the staff members um, of the school district, and then tonight our community meeting right now. And then um, with the idea that we're coming to the board October twelfth for approval for a site validation in our housing option. And then on the 25th, um, we would have our next community outreach meeting post the board decision. So we're gonna open it up, um, I'll move it to end to action, open it up for Q&A &A and. Thank you. Um, so there's a few ways we have, a, we have time now for questions and answers. Um, we also have post-its out at the tables. If you wanna jot anything down, you can leave it on the white paper that's out there in the hallway. I know space is a little limited here to, to come to the center of the room. So um, you can raise your hand. What we're gonna do is take five questions from people who are present in the room here, then move to five questions online and go back and forth um, to take everyone's questions and, and provide time for responses. And I'll also be taking notes here as well as we're taking notes online. So it'll be well documented. Uh, so let's open it up. If there's any questions, you can raise your hand and I'll bring you the mic. And please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass the mic over so that people online can also hear. Thank you. Uh, good evening, folks. I'm just a parent for the fifth grader, Yvette McGuire. Uh, just a basic question: Will this slide deck be available electronically? I'll jump in and answer that because I was going to say that after I was watching everybody take pictures of the slides. Yeah, we actually have a Measure G page on our website. So we're going to populate, you know, any FAQs from community questions as well as any presentations we do. Uh, 
Hi there, my name is James Shepard. I'm a father of a fifth grader and a first grader at Old Mill School. So I can appreciate that this is a difficult problem to solve, undoubtedly, but when could somebody articulate to us what the educational experience of our children is going to be like if this place, if, if I understand the plan correctly, this will effectively be a full construction zone with the students sort of getting their education on the side of the construction zone. And it's basically gonna last the duration, I think at least of my fifth graders middle school experience. So again, I know this is a tough problem to solve, but I'm just hearing sort of tactical representation of how bodies are gonna be moved around sites. When can we hear what that educational experience for our children will be like? I'll start by acknowledging that uh, having gone through many of these processes, we understand that this is absolutely a disruption to education. And we know that when we partner well with our builders that we work hard to minimize uh, the disruptions that your students are going to face, keeping the jobs, putting safety first at all times. But we acknowledge that this is a disruption uh, for ultimately for the greater good you know and, and in, at the end of it you'll have amazing new facilities that that you'll be really proud of but it is a disruption uh, i think that the answer to what that disruption looks like will come you know once we have a, a clear a clear action on where our site's going to be i think we can develop the site logistics a little bit better and you know i think the conceptual you want to talk about the at least the conceptual schedule when they might see it, it involves both our builder and our architect sort of determining. Yeah, so uh, one of the next steps as the builders come on board is to explore uh, the multiple options, both from a cost disruption and logistical standpoint. And that then will allow us to present to all of you this temporary, what feels like it's permanent because it it's one of your students' entire experience um, solutions. So there are things we can do uh, by creating outdoor spaces and shade structures and other things, even in these temporary campuses that can bring that sense of community to them. We've done that um, a lot, uh, but it it is disruptive. And as someone who would like a lot more architects and builders in our future, I'm hoping it ex inspires some of those students to uh, uh, enter the profession. So uh, looking at it as an optimist, as I always am, uh, I think that being able to uh, share the experience with um, doing things like tours of the construction and beam signings and teaching students in their classroom about uh, what's happening out there um, is how, you know, you make lemonade, I guess. I, I, I just, can't add, answer the educational side of that. Well, from as a former educator, I will tell you that I, I personally have experienced, back then it was learning for life. I don't know if that's still a term used today, but I will tell you that I experienced some very rich and rewarding educational experiences because folks like Laura or builders that will actually come into the, into the classrooms and talk about what they're doing and and how they're doing it. And I've really seen uh, students be inspired through that process. So it is, you know, making lemonade with lemons, but I will tell you, it's very valuable and it's something we'll encourage uh, from, from all of our partners. Couple questions in the back. Hi there, thank you. Uh, Chris Bailey, I have a seventh grader at the middle school and a fourth grader at Old Mill. Um, so just for quick context, I've been investing in infrastructure projects for 20 years. I've invested already $8 billion of capital. The, the thing that's not adding up to me is when I look at the pros and cons, they actually kind of lead to an answer that the Edna School is actually a simpler solution. There's lots of unanswered questions, environmental, permitting matrix, that still seem to be open on the middle school question. If I was approaching this as an investor, I would first wanna answer some of those environmental and permitting matrix questions between the two different sites. And I would also have the contractors bid out a very simple high level bid on the option Edna and option middle school. So I'd have a very clear cost benefit analysis for a very expensive project. So I guess my question is, it feels like premature to do a site selection if we don't yet have a very clear 
feasibility analysis of permitting questions and costs. I'll start if you want, and then you can finish. Um, not to disagree with you um, at all. Investigations, further investigations tell us a lot more. And so what we hope is that when we present, uh, it's it's almost, it's almost like that term peeling an onion, peeling back the layers of the onion. Uh, it's, it's, we, we hope that uh, with the years of experience that we have here, that with those initial peels, we, we know where the information is leading. And our objective really is to give the board enough data to make an informed decision and use our experience to, to really um, summarize at a high level where we think that data is leading. And to, to the point of Edna, I think that certainly we could investigate that further. But you have to know that with with limited funds, you know, we're thinking about the fiduciary responsibility that we have to the district, the limited amount of funds that we have, the more investigations that we do are coming at a great expense and with a, a significant amount of time, another environmental investigation of another site, it essentially stops the decision to move forward with construction anywhere. And that's a 10 to 12 month hit on the schedule. And we all know that time is money. And so, you know, we're already stopping the process of, of the decision of where the middle school is going to be at least a year based on, um, you know, want to do further investigations. And so we could certainly do that. But we do think that, that um, it's a slippery slope. Uh, when you get into the, the, first of all, moving the kids out of Edna into other schools could trigger, there's a minimum square footage that that's disrupted in other sites, you, you begin to have to upgrade those sites to all current codes. And so it, it may not be as simple as just moving students from one site to four sites. There may be a whole host of improvements have to be done with infrastructure, square footage, seismic. There's a lot we just don't know. Now, certainly we could go out and do that investigation, but again, that's a lot of time and a lot of money, but, but our experience tells us that that's gonna happen. If you move students from Edna to other elementary school sites, it's going to be much, much more involved and expensive than we could probably anticipate right now. That's that's further from that. Now we talk about the Edna site. Well, if we're turning classrooms, kindergarten classrooms that were built, however many years, I don't remember how many years ago, into into uh, middle school sites, and we're turning elementaries, kindergartens into um, uh, science facilities. I know from personal experience that that was an easy, easy decision for us to do at one point in a school that we experienced together. What we didn't realize is back then, two inch drain pipes were the code. Now they're three inch, right? So it's a whole new level of infrastructure improvement to get the current code. And then there's seismic. Seismic is a completely different story today than it was back in those days. What's the extent of that? We don't know. Could we find out? Absolutely. But again, it's a lot of time. And that's a lot of money, and our experience is telling us that that's that's why we said it's the longest time frame and probably the most disruptive to students. And that's why we, you know, at this level, um, recommended that we look at just the middle school site, the data we have. But certainly, you know, we can go out and get more and more data and present more and more data. We think we know where it's going to lead, but again, it's a lot of time and a lot of money. The only thing I was going to add is that I think um, the uh, the determination to move the Edna students onto the other school sites uh, is not one that's going to come easily either, right? If any of you have ever been involved in school districts when they close um, a school, um, that is a whole then separate process and a separate engagement that um, it the time may be worth it uh, to have that conversation, uh, but it, it won't come easily or quickly is my prediction. And so uh, we, we intuitively took that into account in this recommendation. We have one more question back here and then we'll move up. Hi, uh, my name is George Deferis. I have a uh, sixth grader here at the MVMS and a second grader at Edna. Now I understand there's some of the logistics that you still need to figure out, but uh, with like options here at MVMS, you know, with a different amount of construction that that's going to take place, do you at least have, you know, 
an idea of what this means in terms of like, you know, time to, you know, break ground and, you know, uh, sort of also talking to the amount of disruption, you know, how long those different, different construction plans will take at least, you know, uh, at this point. Uh, clearly the most disruptive time frame is going to be during construction and we can go back to those timelines. The slides are available also, but uh, what was the construction schedule on? Page eight. How many months? A construction will last two years for the middle school. Do the different options have different time frames? Potentially, uh, if we were to build on the east, for example, and the interim housing uh, was uh, really minimal because we were able to house uh, students here remain here while construction was going on, uh, we could certainly accelerate um, that portion of the project. And there, there's a cost implication of that as well. There are other issues with the side, uh, uh, the sea level rise being one of them. It is the lowest part of the site and closest to um, where the water is coming from. So as we those engineering studies happen, those will be why we recommended that the three studies continue to move forward for the Mill Valley site so we could put that engineering data in front of all of you. years of construction. So the temporary housing would be constructed between 2024 and 2025 so that in the school year, starting fall of 2025, students would be in the interim housing with the permanent school opening for school year 27-28, two years of construction. Some of those, um, we can't accelerate all of the time of the interim housing because there are state agencies involved that have a plan review time and we want to give this project enough time to have the engagement it deserves, but um, there is some potential to shorten that schedule uh, if interim housing doesn't become a, a driver or a critical path timeline issue. Hi, my name is Issa. I have a current uh, sixth grader and I have an Ed McGuire fourth grader. Thank you for doing this presentation and providing this information. There's a lot of good information you provided, but there's a lot of information that's not on the slides. I mean, it's not just about dollar signs and soil samples. Um, and also some of the preliminary um, di direction from the board seems to indicate de decisions about community, like not ripping apart the Edna McGuire community, which some of us appreciate, as well as you know keeping together the middle school as a community, which many of us also appreciate. When will we see some of those other factors because there seems like there's a lot that needs to go into these decisions and we're only getting a really, really high level snapshot. When do we get that information? When do we get to participate? What kind of community input is going to be solicited on the options for the location? Because it's not just about dollar signs and soil samples, but again, I know you could poll us all now and we'd all have different opinions, so you have to balance that. So understanding all of that when will we get more of that media information and that data you keep talking about and that balance of data that really is going to go in to inform the ultimate decision the boards make? And then could you just confirm that all of these timelines are preliminary with a lot of onion layers and a lot of things that could be surprises? Of so course. we shouldn't be hanging our hats? I'll let you talk about the timeline, but first let me just, um, before you reiterate that having come from education, the importance of these community forums is to start early. And it is early because we need to hear what's important to you. And that's why we're having more of these. So, you know, as you give us information that we need to gather for you, it's important to hear, so. 
As to timeline, um, the site selection program and conceptual design, so when you get home and get this copy on page 10, uh, indicated we're in the first of uh, five community meetings between now and February. There is also a steering committee uh, being formed for the uh, middle school specifically, the programming element of that, where we start to envision the spaces and their interconnectedness and how that interconnectedness plays with the different site locations and things. So we are at a clip of one of those per month between now and February when the multiple options will be presented to the board along with costs from our lease lease back partners um, so that they can make informed decisions. That also buys us, if I'm being honest, a little bit of time to dig into some of these engineering studies that, as I mentioned, we have some of them they're aging, right? So we need to make sure they're updated uh, to today's standards, whether it's the sea level rise maps, the geotechnical reports and other things to make sure that nothing has changed markedly that would influence um, or add to our pros and cons list. Back to work. We're gonna take a few questions from online and then we'll come back to the room. We'll get to everyone. If interim, Jamie would like to know, if interim housing occurs at the current middle school site, how will you handle limiting construction noise, dust, et cetera, to limit effects on the ability of students to access their education? Well, there's the standard uh, dust control measures that we always implement on sites, especially occupied sites, which would be probably consider this occupied site. If uh, we're going to have a uh, middle school uh, operational during the construction, so uh, all of these issues are always taken into consideration, and uh, it's going to be a plan of plan of uh, our special conditions. Jamie would also like, also like to know if interim housing occurs at the current middle school, where will students eat lunch, socialize, etc. The outdoor space and large library are quite full currently. I think that is yet to come. Uh, some of the meetings we'll have where we um, propose the design for interim housing will have those considerations. So here's an option that creates a courtyard out of the modular buildings. Could that center area have a shade structure that students could eat under, right? Uh, or do we create a, a small village of um, portable buildings that each have their own uh, courtyard space for outdoor uh, dining and gathering and outdoor learning? So I think what you saw today is simply test fit. Could we even do it? And then we're going to dig into what can we live without? What can what space can we recapture to maximize the uh, experience of the students? And, um, you know, I'll tell you, the state architect makes us design these as if they're going to be here for 40 years. I know you've all seen schools that have portables that have been there for 40 years. And so... Um, uh, it will be designed with safety, accessibility, uh, security, and as well as those amenities of outdoor space um, for, for the students to make it really as pleasant as we can make it during that time. Uh, sound blankets, right, on construction fencing. There's a lot of things uh, we can do like that. I know a lot of our contractor partners are in the audience today, but they will... Um, also uh, change their hours of operation as needed, work around testing schedules, for example. All of those things um, are taken into consideration uh, when they are brought on board and talk about the logistical planning. And from Laura, she says, I have a sixth grader at MVMS. When will we better understand the sustainability aspects of the new campus? In particular, if it is feasible for the building to be all electric. Thank you. Well, good news is the new code that went into effect in January requires all electric for all new uh, construction and all new uh, schools, as well as solar offset uh, for the um, 
the demand that's created. So uh, those along with EV chargers and 50% uh, shading on all asphalt surfaces um, were all new code implementation. And certainly every code iteration since the time this school was built has uh, raised the level of sustainability that's now considered baseline. Uh, what we'll be exploring, and it's listed in that tiny, tiny print in um, uh, the third steering committee meeting is uh, what else? Is there some what else uh, that the district wants to um, explore beyond uh, that new high standard of code minimum? Laura would also, also has, and when will the plan for MVMS student relocation be finalized? It sounds like there are still a few options on the table. I believe that's the February meeting, right, Julio? Where we yeah the first quarter of um, the first quarter of 2024, we're shooting for the February school board meeting. We would have um, request of approval for conceptual design, and then that, with the, along with the pricing, would be the the outlook for temporary housing. Okay, we're gonna take a few more from within the room. I'm gonna, I know there were some hands up over here and then we'll come to you all. Hi, I'm Julia Kazel and I have a fifth, second and kindergarten student at Edna McGuire. And I just, I'm going back to the portables. Can someone describe what we're talking about? I'm not sure I'm familiar with the, um, what portable classrooms would look like, how big they are and what, or maybe images you could share with us or something sure. to better uh, The portable classrooms about. that are out near the multi-purpose building here, those are considered portable classrooms. Okay. And so it'd be all that? Uh, it would Everything. be all that. And uh, typically they're uh, 960 square feet for a classroom, which is kind of a state average. And most of your classrooms here are about that size. Um, they have different proportions. We can get enlarged ones for science or other things. Uh, but generally um, the, what you see adjacent to the um, the multi-purpose building here are the type of buildings that would be utilized. And would it be the same number of them as exist, like same classroom number? Or there, will there be fewer classrooms under the temporary situation? We will certainly explore if there is any ability to do less and spend less money, but the anticipation is a one-for-one -one change for each teacher to move into their own classroom. Could you uh, go back to consideration slide number two, please? Hi, y'all. Thank you very much for today. Appreciate it. Appreciate you presenting and actually appreciate you pr uh, providing the presentation early on. If y'all don't know me, my name is Brian O'Sullivan. I'm a homeowner taxpayer here in Mill Valley. I have a fifth grader and a first grader at Old Mill School. And next slide, please. So my real point is the soils. And it's what you've heard, which is a little surprising to me, because you say it's a possible landfill such as refuse, rubble, man-made debris, Mill Valley, presence of groundwater, bay mud. I get all that. But in the time I was able to, you made this online, we were able to do a bit of research. And it is true that this site, which the Mill Valley Middle School sits on, and the community center, and the sewage unit, is the former dump, the Mill Valley. It was a burn site and operated for about 20 years, 1920s to the 1950s. This site is also, with a bit of research, designated and registered by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency as a Superfund site. That number is ID CAN 000905996. This site is also listed by the Department of Toxic Substance Control in Firostore 218-20002. There have been studies where they found heavy metals, right? You do have methane gas pockets under here. The gym, the portables have vents with sensors and those sensors detect that. So my real question is about safety. You're proposing options that you wanna put this community's children on a site known for toxic soil. And you wanna demolish a school and build it and put our children here? I'd like to better understand your plans for safety. And I'd like to also better understand what your fallback plan is to move the children off site.
the the super fun study that you that you referenced is puts the site a bit uh, availability for federal funding as a recognition but i will say that uh, the presence of methane is not uncommon uh in any site in fact you've probably got a couple of them you're dealing with now it's it's just something we deal with um i would say that if if it were if the department of toxic substance substance control dtsc had found anything at an alarming level it we wouldn't be open now uh th there's just there's schools that don't get to open because they're on they're built on power lines in LA and those types of things. But if there was anything super alarming to them, I think they would have there would have been a some sort of a shutdown measure early on. So I would without digging into what their findings are, I would tell you that probably it's not anything that's not um, mitigatable, and that's what we'll look into. But there's also we know there's challenges with with other sites as well as we're digging into the 2018 data at Edna, we've we've learned recently that there's, um, when they did that construction site, they found how many? 13 skeletons. And the pale paleontological requirements back when that school was built is far less than the requirements are today. And that could shut down a site for two to three years or even eliminate it as, as a possibility. So again, I think that's probably a mitigating consideration that we we have to think about is is that site more dangerous potentially in terms of even being useful? And um, our our initial investigations just don't show that there's nothing that we can't mitigate in terms of capping the site and making it safe. The other thing is the Department of Toxic Substance Control will be involved in this process um, in order to access state 